Um, God, thank you for Yuji. Thank you just for the word that you've put on his heart. God, I ask that, um, Lord, that you would be speaking through him. God, that you would just give him boldness and that um, your spirit would just be coding all of his words in love and in grace um, that we would be able to receive from it. I ask that you would just cover him in your peace. Um, and God, that today's message, Lord, that your spirit would just be... Um, behind it, Lord, that you would be uh, teaching all of us um, to just be able to draw closer to you. So I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and greetings to you all. It's, it's an honor as I have the opportunity to share with you on the exposition of God's Word. <laughs> I happened to break my notebook, so I have to use this reader, which is somehow not working for me right now <laughs> yes oh yeah okay just uh, patience please with me i get you i'm uh, i'm working on my notes <laughs> sorry it just doesn't work okay in any case um not because the notes but always please <laughs> whoever wherever is talking to you about god's word be like the parents test it if it's so according to the scriptures and and yeah uh, special greetings go to our pastors in sunny croatia kelsey and john and also to my love uh, caitlin in cold south africa now <laughs> um let's begin we're in first samuel and i wanted to just give you some examples of um punishment of some armies or actually in one particular army for severe offenses and i'm going to read from u.s code 885 art 80 and something sleeping on the post three years imprisonment in subordination where the offense is of exceptional gravity or in the face in the line of the enemy imprisonment for life or death now mutiny very similar and desertion death what i'm trying to do is just you know not to comment on any current situation but uh, put a david into some extreme escalating situation he got himself into um, when you read the chapter 29 in the bible just a moment, I really need to have it work it out somehow. So if you if you look at David, just without any background, you can see him either way as an innocent victim of circumstances or as a traitor, a deserter. He's in the midst of the philistine territories right and what i'm trying to do right now is just to uh, get us a little bit into a uh, challenge our black and white thinking and i'm not thinking of uh, libor and zainab i'm just uh, i'm just thinking that we are uh, quite often uh, like to label things you know good and bad right and wrong and, and so on and, and we miss the, the truth and truth does matters right we have the tendency to see the things as we think they are instead of the as they are right so we do interpret situation based on our feelings based our on our upbringing based on our you know whatever theological echo chamber we live at and you know even worse we embrace whoever uh, whatever the religious leader tells us is this is so or some political commentator or whatever instead of like really try to see to be in uh, the shoes even of our enemies or our friends and, and just to try to see it more clearly so that's that's my uh, that's what i'm gonna challenge in, in this message and obviously we know that the stories are not in black and white and definitely not the uh, bible stories uh, today we will see three main uh, major turning points david is in difficult situation he got himself there and before he actually hits the rock uh, the bottom 
we can see the God's providence, providence, how God delivered him. And then there is a, I would call a hard wake up call for David. And then there is a restoration. And again, and I keep saying this uh, quite often, <laughs> when we look at the scripture, we always have to look at, at it holistically. I mean, from the bird's point of view, we have to see it as one redemptive story which culminates on the cross. We cannot just take pieces of the literature. It's a Bible is, you know, collection of books from different authors, from, you know, different eras, and they, they react on different political and cultural situation. And we can say the Bible, whatever we feel like to say, right? And this has been happening in the past. You can basically justify almost anything from the Bible, right? And it's gonna happen in today, and it's gonna happen always. So it's really important uh, is to see the whole picture, the context, and all those things put together so that we can actually see God more clearly, and us as well. So, um, yeah, because Jesus said this truth, he's the truth, the truth will set you free, but if you have like, uh, you know, uh, wrong portrait of Jesus, you know, you are not really getting free. <laughs> Uh, and historically, we know that uh, that you know if you look at David, right? He's the hero. He is the the one we always look after in the Sunday school. We want to be like he, him, right? He's the one who kills Goliath. He's the one we we try to see how, uh, you know, live like him. But, you know, the truth is that we should not look at David and, or try to be like David. We, of course, can get and, and identify with David in many ways. But, you know, our goal is to be holy, right? God calls us to be holy. Jesus made it possible. He gave us his holiness. So our goal is to look always on Jesus and interpret everything else uh, through his lenses. Now, back to David, again, in the context of chapter 29, David, according to, like, I would understand, he's a traitor, and he's actually a deserter, and he's even, as you we go through the text, he's going to try to fight, or at least doesn't um, want to avoid fighting his own people. Now, if you read the story of Bathsheba, right? Very, very well-known story. You see David as a horrible uh, man who abused his power. He seduced this innocent uh, woman, right? Committed adultery, and then he's trying to cover it up. And, you know, uh, on the end, he doesn't work, so he gets uh, his loyal servant killed, which is horrible. So how do we justify this? Uh, in regards of what uh, God says about David and how, how come God did not foresee those things, right? I can move this thing on. So God has called David. He calls him that he's man after his own heart, right? And, uh, and we see also that he is quite often in the situation where uh, his own heart is telling him something else than how uh, God would tell him. Or uh, what I mean is to be outside of God's will. How did David actually get into the Philistines? Let me just read briefly. <laughs> Then the David said in his heart, Now I shall perish, one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than I should escape to the land of Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So this was reasoning of David that led him into the enemy's territories. And by the way, if you read the stories for the second time. And I, I'm, I'm just wondering, because this is actually telling something about us. I see myself so often actually reasoning like this. I shall perish if I don't do this. I shall perish, you know, if, uh, if I, God, I, if, if, if uh, I don't do, uh, if I don't go uh, where I shouldn't go. 
because you know, if you think of it, all the evil can be rationalized, right? You have the ideologies, which you know I have to kill in order to progress with my ideology. I have to, I have to, you know, do this uh, unethical business conduct, you know, in order for me to uh, rise up in my career. I shall perish, right? I shall perish if if I don't do so. And this is a great challenge for us to uh, see how God is actually talking to us through the stories of the Bible quite often. It's not in black and white, right? <laughs> David is definitely not, you know, good or bad. Uh, he is a mixture of those things. But his heart, you know, his heart can deceive him, but ultimately his heart is, and as we will see as the story develops, is uh, after God's heart. And, uh, you know, majority of the stories in the Bible, actually, you know, not only that they actually uh, carry the redemptive story of, of uh, the revelation which culminates on the cross, the stories in the Bible are conveying, the, gives us the eternal truth. And those eternal truths, they always uh, appear. They always truth. Like the story, of course, of the fall. The story of Cain and Abel, right? And in the Sunday school, we'll say, I want to be like Abel. I want to f bring the first fruit, right? But the truth is, the Bible wants to read us. We have to also recognize we are Cain as well. You know, we hate our, our brother quite often, and so all those things. So all those things uh, intertwine. And I want to show you today, actually, how, how uh, some of the narratives which we have today, because you read in, and there is not really much uh, explanation of what is right or wrong, the author of the Bible expects with God, obviously, but you know, when uh, the people are reading it, they expect, you know, those who have written it, they expect that you already know, you know, the law, that you already know the other stories, so you can put it all together and get for yourself uh, the, the needed application, but you know, the application is the thing which changes you, right? The application should not be another law for you. So as, as the stories in the Bible go, they give you a way of seeing the reality of the world so that you understand the divine purpose and it's training you to know the patterns in on your own life, like so, so that you can actually move you know, from the vicious circle of repetitive sins, for instance, and so on. So I have to, these things coming really half time. And uh, if you look at David, he's running away for his life, right? He's got legitimate reasons to, to hide somewhere. But it's interesting that, you know, he runs after when King Saul actually blesses him. You know, if you go back to the story, David uh, spares Saul's life, and, and, and Saul blesses David. And then the story continues with this. David says in his heart, you know, next time maybe will God not protect me or something like that, right? <laughs> next time it's going to be something which, uh, uh, which uh, will really kill me. So I need to run to the land of uh, Philistines, which is, you know, again, to trying to justify it. Uh, wrongdoing, I would say. Because, you know, there's never written anywhere, and I don't want to make any ICGs, but it's not written there that, they, that God would have told David to run into these uh, enemy's territories. Um, now, so one thing I want to show you today, because I think it just came to my mind. There was two things I will uh, show you. This is like the one thing which reminds me the story of Elijah later on. Elijah experiences great God's victory, you know, against those ba Baal's uh, prophets. You know, the fire devours the wet of offering and, and, you know, the, they are done with, with uh, they are dealt with. And then Jezebel scares David, uh, sorry, David, uh, Elijah, and Elijah runs away. So that is a pattern which you can see in the Bible. I shall perish if I don't do something. Again, I'm going to say it again, I'm at work and I'm doing something and I 
may reason myself, oh my goodness, I have no, um, I should not do this, but you know, I need to feed my family. Uh, I shall perish. So I have to do it. Preachers, often, uh, or pastors, you know, I know I should uh, teach the whole counsel of, of God, but you know, I, you know um, maybe the people will not come back again. So I just need to tell them what they like so that they feel good about themselves. And, and you can, you know, uh, put into this whatever, right? It's just the reason and we do, right? And uh, I cannot help, I, I, shall, I'll, I shall perish. So where are you, where am I? Somewhere in the deep of enemy's territories. That was my point before I get any uh, further. And I, oh wow. Okay, <laughs> the next thing which I have on the slide is David is in the midst of the enemy territories, Philistines, and I don't want to read it all, but basically what is happening is the Philistines are gathering for a major battle against Israel, and David is supposed to go with them. Um, and now here is what basically I would call one of the example of gracious God's providence. Because when the leaders see David, you know, with his men preparing for the battle, they say, send the man back. They may, he may return to the place which you have assigned him. He shall not go down with us to the battle, lest in the battle he becomes an adversary to us. For how could this fellow reconcile himself to his Lord? Would it not be with the heads of the men here? Is it not this, David, of whom they sing to one another in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands? Question mark. So what you can see here is um, something which we cannot never uh, figure out. Why things are happening in some way? Why things, why, why things are not working the way we want them to work? And uh, we don't know how many times the God's providence was in our lives, right? We don't know. But imagine that uh, God would allow David to go to the battle, right? Imagine that this common sense of those Philistine officers would let him to the battle which is already decided, right? Because if you, if you uh, go back to the chapter 28, which Libor was preaching on, you see that the, the battle is on the, uh, will be won by the Philistines, and tomorrow will be the day Saul will be killed, and on top of that, his uh, best friend Jonathan will die, as you see. So imagine that uh, if God's providence would not allow David, uh, would allow, would not stop uh, what David actually wanted to do, and you know, you can hear all kinds of interpretation what David might have, would have, could have done, but I te I'm telling you, that would be absolute disaster for David to be there uh, on the side of uh, the Philistines. So let me move on. In okay, I was here. Um, this is also important. So after this, I will read this because I really find it amazing. Then Achish called David and said to him, "As the Lord lives, you have been honest to me. It seems right that you should march out and with me in the campaign, for I have found nothing wrong in you." From the day of your coming to me to this day, nevertheless, the lords do not approve you. Now, what is really important here is, and I, I think you might get it, is that the Echish says, as the Lord, Yahweh, lives. And isn't it amazing that he basically recognizes that Yahweh is the living God, an enemy king. And I found it like, I know there's the pattern in, in the Bible, because another the parallel in the Bible, or the pattern which you can find in Jonah, right? When Jonah is not doing what God told him to do, 
he finds himself on the ship, right? And what, you know, you know the story, they, they have to get rid of him because God is causing the storm. But what do those pagans say? Therefore they called out to the Lord, Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. Again, this is a pattern which we see that God is using you know, the disobedience and in his providence, he actually does uh, reaches the pagan. What does he tell you about God? Of course, you know, God loves the pagans too. He loves the Philistines as well, right? <laughs> and uh, for us, God will accomplish his plans whether we submit to him or not. And I think it's really uh, important for us to understand this. Because, you know, regardless knowing this, and actually knowing this, if it's setting you free. Because if you know that God will accomplish his purpose, right, and whether, whether you want to do what he wants you to do, you will move from the black and white thinking, you know, I'm, I have to do this in order for God to, to do that. I have to, you know, fast more in order to God give me this, and, and so on. Well, what, what God wants you to understand is, I, I really don't need you, I want you, because I love you so much, I want you to, to work with me. It's the best for you, you know what I mean? And, and, and the motivation, I think it's Jetty was saying, like the motivation is so important. The motivation of the fact that we should do things, not because uh, we feel guilty or because we feel um, fear. I mean, the healthy fear of God is good, but uh, you know, it's not what normally people would think. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I have to do this so I don't go hell to hell or whatever. So <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to see you know, where, where we are as a church often, like um, instead of doing the God's will or uh, in the enemy's territories, or, or the, on the other hand, where we are uh, you know, uh, doing things, uh, just in order because we have to do it. And I think this goes back to the point what I'm trying to make, the, the shift in us must come from inside, right? And you know, realize that as you could not save yourself, you cannot also unsave yourself. And you know, the sin is not identify you anymore. It's Jesus who gave you his righteousness. He's the one who gave you his holiness. So the change must come from inside out. And sometimes, sometimes you just, you know, need the wake-up call, um, which we will see later on happened in the case of David. But again, the David story is more profound because we still have the Old Testament kind of deuter deuteronomy thinking instead of grace thinking. We think when we gonna comply with all the God's uh, law, right? If we do uh, tithe properly, if we do read the Bible, whatever it means properly, if we pray enough, if we do, God has to do this, right? But you know, ironically, ironically, I mean like, where is it in the Bible, firstly like this? The nation of Israel had his own purpose, right? It, it, it was something special. They were about to bring the blessings to other nations. And they were light of the other nations. And if you read the stories, you know, God used uh, and, and glorified his name despite of disobedience of uh, Israel. We should not really, we should learn from this and, you know, see ourselves as well. And freed ourselves from this kind of, you know, um, black and white thinking and really understand who we are in, in God. Because then, 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 then we will really shift from the patterns of our lives. We are set into it. And we are always uh, often taught uh, like this. So again, God will not be super impressed by your pious behavior. God really wants your heart, like, like David's uh, heart, right? So we, we it's, it's not saying that the law is bad or anything like, the law is to crush us. Understand that you know, the only one who can keep the law is Jesus, and he done it already for us. And uh, as I say, you know, David, is the one, and he said, look, look at David. Uh, David is the one who wrote the most of the Psalms. You see his heart, right? He is the one who said, the Lord is the stronghold of my life. The Lord is my salvation. I shall not fear. The Lord is my shepherd, and all those things. And I shall not be afraid. Even though the army encamps against me, I will not fear. Even though war breaks out against me, 
yeah, I shall be confident, and the same David will say, I shall perish, so I will have to run to my enemy's camp, right? So, but the story of David is, is more profound, because the story of David is really uh, showing us, in many ways, how we do act sometimes, and oftentimes, actually, and there is also, you know, the, the lesson that, um, that can, kind of... Uh, goes against the Deuteronomy thinking because David was doing all the right things, right? And it, was, it did not go well for him, right? He, he, he was uh, constantly after, uh, the Saul was constantly after to kill him when he was really submitting to God. But then, you know, he just uh, could not go over it and uh, end up in the Philistine territory, which was not uh, obviously the will of God. But then comes the wake up call. Then comes something which uh, in all of us um, all of us often we need, right? So David doesn't go to the battle in God's providence and he returns to his town where all his uh, wives and, and other people, wives lived and uh, let me read it. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, bold and small and great. They killed no one but carried them off and went their way. Well, a little bit of the background uh, who Amalekites are and the difference between Philistines. So Amalekites were just like, you know, smaller tribes. Uh, they call them like hordes, usually like preying on, on uh, like abandoned cities and so on. I'm generalizing, I'm painting like black and white a little bit. But Philistines were uh, a nation, like really structured with a monarchy. And they, you, can, you can see them also like Israelites in a sense. Israelites, they came uh, from the from the desert and uh, to the promised land. And Philistines, they were trying to, they came from the sea, they called them sea people. They were trying to uh, invade Egypt, they did not succeed, so they went down to the promised land and they were trying to find their living there. So just to let you know uh, that, that how it was. But for David, I think this was something which changed the direction of his. Because when we, when we go and read further, what happens, and David was obviously greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters, but David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. And now, what I was just ramping, <laughs> rattling about before is here, because David did, David did what is really what we should always do. We should look upon the Lord. We should not look at ourselves. We should look upon God. He is the salvation. And he, David finally realizes who he is. Um, because he remembers that the Lord, you know, delivered him from Saul. The Lord put Goliath into his, uh, into his hands and all, all, all those things. So the Lord, it, it, this is the application for us. Always look at uh, the Lord, wherever you are. Don't try to start with uh, some self-salvation efforts. Uh, look at the Lord, and let's continue right now, because I want to get, uh, what continues is also for us, and David inquired of the Lord. Shall I pursue after this band, or shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue, for you surely shall overtake them, and shall surely rescue all those. Again, there is one thing which I want to tell you. <laughs> He did strengthen himself to the Lord. He found back, you know, his identity. And then he walks with God again. He's talking to him. He's asking what to do. Shall I do it or not? And uh, there is a next step for us in this. What uh, ensue is David did what he was told to do. I mean, it's natural that he will go and uh, try to um, save uh, his own people. But, you know, in a sense, it's the obedience that God told him, yes, you will do it, and that's what happened. So David recovered all what the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two, two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons and daughters spoil anything that had been taken. David broke, brought back all, everything. And this is where, basically, it's like, like a shift in the David's life, if you think of it. Now the David is becoming the shadow of Jesus, 
because there are many things which are uh, like showing what Jesus done for us. He's the one who saves us, right? We, we cannot save ourselves. He is the one who um, recovers what was lost due to our disobedience or because we need a savior. And in a, in a sense, you know, once David is back in his sen senses, he keeps going and that leads us more or less to the restoration part because this is already in a sense the restoration right David recovered and if I shall read all this let me think this just to illustrate the David's role as uh, the type of Messiah. So then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David and who had been left at the brook Besor. And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among them who had gone with David said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may, let, may lead away his wife and children and depart. But David said, you shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given to us. He preserved us and given into our hands the band that came against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is as, as his share is, who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be, who stays by the baggage. They shall, they shall share alike. And he made it a statue and rule of, for Israel from the day forward to this day. So here is again David who, who is the shadow of Messiah. He is like like in many ways, wicked and worthless way, this is the narrator saying, but you know, when Jesus approaches some uh, situation, he will call you brood of vipers, right? He's given to them who don't uh, deserve in the eyes of some, you know, the spoil and everything. He acknowledges that it's all Lord who has given. It's not David who did it, right? Uh, and if you read later on, he's trying to restore what he lost by being in the Philistine territories where he sends the spoil to the leaders of Judah and to his friends. So, I wonder what else I have it here, but I think I'm just gonna a little bit uh, re recap of what uh, we have just read and learned. So basically, you know, again, the, the, here is the example of how we should turn from the situations we are at, right? We should not beat ourselves. Um, we should, of course, and the repentance, really the change of our minds, the change of directions is to realize in who we are. And that only this will help us to move from the enemy's territories. And yes, sometimes we do need wake up call. Sometimes we do need Nathan's in our lives who will tell us, you know, you are wrong. Sometimes we are called to be Nathans. I think it's even more uh, difficult, right? Because we have to approach the people who do uh, not walk with the Lord with some nice uh, uh, way. We should believe God's promise. We should do what God told us. And we have to acknowledge that, you know, all what we do is um, either way doing on our own, on our effort, or we doing it in the cooperation with the Lord. So it's Lord's victory in our lives. So as we, as we close, I think we, the journey which we were on <laughs> or with Samuel, um, the main point is, I mean, in, a, in this sense, God is with us, you know, whether we feel like to or not. He leads us through the valleys. He works his ways in ways we cannot understand. We just, we just, uh, he doesn't want us to do things because we have to, because uh, we feel guilty or because we fear him, but he wants us to do things out of love for him. Um, so let's just embrace uh, 
this and yeah I think this is um, all what I have for you today it was a little bit messy with my notes uh, apologies for that um, after the service is over which is getting to it right now uh, will there will, will be some home group leaders perhaps um, other people who can pray for you if you have any prayer requests then so you can stand and come forward you are encouraged to do so and also um, if you all can stand because I want to bless you I want to give you the benediction as you go the service will not be here next week it will be on the river island so before you leave this place and go serve the Lord receive the words straight from Jesus Christ and he's saying to you I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace in the world you will have tribulation but take heart I have overcome the world and Jesus also said to you to the disciples but he's saying this to you as well peace be with you as the Father has sent me even so I am sending you so receive the Shalom receive Jesus peace and thousands will be saved as they look at you go in peace and please if those helpers prayer leaders just uh, one final word uh, for the month of July we will not be meeting here but you know this bridge right around the corner is the Charles Bridge and if you go down to the next bridge you'll see that there's an island underneath it and it's uh, called Straletsky Ostrov. The service will be at the same time, starting at 11. You can come early, of course. It's suggested if you have a, a picnic blanket, if you have some, uh, some uh, snacks or even lunch, if you want to stay on something to drink, could be a hot day or a hot four Sundays, but uh, that's where we're going to be and we will not be in this location. So make sure you head straight for the island, Streletsky Ostrov. So, God bless you. Thank you for coming. I hope you were blessed. As you go, I pray may the Lord go with you. May his presence go with you. And may his grace go with you. Wishing you a lovely week and looking forward to seeing you another week. If you're here, please remember to join a Bible study. If you're going back home, also remember to join a Bible study wherever you go. Be blessed. Bye.